And thanks for joining us for a special edition of On DoD. And this time on the program, we're going to talk about the future of DoD contracting, pricing, acquisition, with some of the key leaders who are at the forefront of training the acquisition workforce and getting them set up for success amidst all the challenges that have happened and, and really are still ongoing in the acquisition landscape. And, and just to name a few of those, we've had a major rewrite of the DoD 5000 series, an explosion in the use of OTAs, the new adaptive acquisition framework, including for the first time breaking software acquisition apart into its own pathway. You've been experimenting with a new dedicated color of money for software. And then just a major transformation in how the workforce works, as, as all of us have kind of had to learn how to transition to telework. And I don't think we're ever completely going all the way back. Also a big transformation underway in training and certification programs for the workforce. And, and the certification part of that is still a work in progress, so we probably won't get into any of those specific certification details today. But, but there are a lot of other details to talk about with three of the individuals who are plugged into developments in the future of defense contracting and pricing more than just about anyone else. We've got Jim Woolsey, the president of Defense Acquisition University, Frank Kelly, the vice president of DAU, and Michelle Courier, professor of contract management at DAU. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. And and what I want to do in this in this first section is ask each of you to give us a general overview from your perspective of where things are headed generally in defense acquisition pricing and contracting, because certainly that's uh, influencing the way that you're creating instructional materials and programming at DAU and the way that you're delivering content at DAU too, I think is fair to say. Um, Jim, let, let me start with you and go to you first. Um, what do you see um, changing right now and heading into the future? Well, uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for inviting us to spend some time talking about what we're doing today. Um, there's some exciting things going on at DU and acquisition, and um, we really appreciate this chance to talk about it. So you actually talked a lot about some of the initiatives going on in acquisition today, and there's a common theme in all of those, which is to push authority down. Um, the, the Congress and the leadership in the Department of Defense have realized that if we're going to be adaptive and respond quickly to our changing environment, authority's got to get pushed down to the people who are doing the work. And that's really a thread that goes through all the initiatives that you just described, that we're empowering people in the workforce to make their own decisions because they have the best knowledge of what's happening. Well, that's happening the way we're doing training as well. We are, we've realized that the old model of training, which was really requirements driven. If you're going to be a contracting officer, you have to take certain things. We realize that people who are doing the work, they know what they need to know and they know the, they know when they need to know it. So we're changing our mindset from being a schoolhouse where you come to class to being a platform that'll give you the information you need at the time you need it. You know what you need and you know when you need it. We want to be there to provide it for you. And as we talk about some of the initiatives and some of the things that Michelle's done and some of the things going at you, you'll see that theme as well. We're trying to go at scale and respond quickly to the needs that people have. That, that's really the big trend in, in defense as well as at DAU. And Frank, fair to say that, that that all reflects, as Jim was kind of alluding to, a shift from point in time you sit in a brick and mortar building type of learning to really lifelong learning. Is that fair? More than fair. Uh, first of all, you, you know, uh, lifelong learning is a term uh, that uh, when I arrived at DAU was gaining quite a bit of traction. And one of the folks out there that uh, Jim can t talk about was uh, Al Schaefer, uh, who was, uh, you know, working in, uh, in ANS as the deputy in there. And he... Uh, was a big fan, is, continues to be a big fan, good relationship with uh, Jim Woolsey. And he would come uh, to DAU and, uh, and spend some time with us. And one of the things that he wanted to do was actually walk around and visit the classrooms you know, and, uh, and for him to be able to make contact. And he would talk about lifelong learning. He's a real, real believer on that. We can see that, that Al Schaefer's fingerprints are all over uh, some of the new initiatives that we have seen, uh, you know, just in the in the last in the last year about about lifelong learning. One other thing that I think is is a is an important thing to think about, and that is when I would get a chance to walk around uh, DAU, I would go to classes that had just program managers in them, 
and just engineers in them. And then I would stumble across those classrooms that had just contracting officers in them. And one of the things that I would say to them, and I was only uh, certified in one career field, program management, I would look at these young contracting officers and I said, look around, all you see are contracting officers with you. This is the last time you'll ever be in that position. And you will be uh, the, the fountain of all knowledge when you get back to your program offices in terms of being, of being the expert on contracts, in terms of being experts on OTs and cost estimating. I said, you gotta act like it. You gotta step up and be the leaders in your career field. And uh, I still believe that, I still believe that to this day. Last thing I wanna say is the big difference for us, engagement, Michelle has done an incredible, incredible job uh, in terms of scaling our engagement and contact with not just the contracting community, but I would say the entire acquisition workforce. And uh, if there's one thing I could encourage you to pull a thread on today uh, for today's uh, discussion, and that would be talk to Michelle about how she's reaching out. Over. We will definitely go there. I want to save it for a future segment, though. Michelle, any any other general comments you want to share about your observations about where things are heading generally in defense contracting and acquisition? So, uh, thank you for that question. What I see is that after our students get their foundational learning in our traditional classes, they need a place to come to for continuous growth, learning, currency, connection. And the marvelous thing I see in these events that we do is the amount of sharing in the chat. They connect with each other. They share resources. They say, hey, I just did that last week. Don't do what I did. Give me, you know, hit me up. Let's connect. And that's the powerful platform that DAU brings is that connection for the folks back at their desk to have somebody to talk about a path forward. And I'm so excited that DAU is providing that powerful platform to keep connection with the workforce. It, it keeps me current, it keeps me excited and keeps me connected back to the workforce. Do, do you proactively pe bring people in who are not necessarily DAU students, but go out and seek practitioners to have those discussions with, with these types of really virtual audiences? I'm so excited you asked that question. We deliberately find subject matter experts currently working in the field in all of our presentations. So DAU becomes the facilitator and we deliberately curate experts from the field, we bring in those folks, but not only that, we purposely find multifunctional experts. So we did one workshop where we had a PM, an industry representative, and a DOD contracting officer. And let me tell you, the collisions during that conversation, you know, were just spectacular because we all think about things from where we sit and sharing that perspective across the entire enterprise is priceless. Let's take our first break here. We will be back in just a minute with our guests from DAU. I'm Jared Serbu, back in just a moment. Back on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Glad you're with us for a special edition of On DoD with our guests, Jim Woolsey, President of Defense Acquisition University, Frank Kelly, the Vice President of DAU, and Michelle Courier, Professor of Contract Management at the Defense Acquisition University, talking about a wide range of ways that things in the defense acquisition world are changing, including how the, the workforce is being trained, lots of changes there as well. And, and before before the break in our previous segment, both Frank and Michelle alluded to the fact that that the way that you're teaching the workforce is much more, as Frank said, multidisciplinary, and as Michelle said, multifunctional. And I wanted to dig into that a little bit more because um, th th that that seems to me like it's probably a little bit of a balance because there are so many pieces of defense acquisition that are highly technical, highly specialized. So how do you train people to start thinking in that more multifunctional way without losing 
the, uh, the, the the specialization that really is sometimes needed in these fields. Whoever wants to jump on that, feel feel free. I'd like to start just talking about that philosophically. A, a big change that is also part of what's happening at DAU, you could say it's moving from a closed system to an open one, where in the old model, a limited number of instructors would teach students who are almost always uniform in what career field they're in and what they were doing in a closed environment. The information came from on high down through instructors and into the classroom. In the open environment we're trying to create now, we're getting voices from all different places to the people who need or want that. So if you're a program management person and you're interested in other transaction authorities, which are important right now, the open system we have allows you to go to a webinar about that or get a credential about that. Um, so we're giving people the opportunity to cross boundaries in a way that they couldn't do before. Not just cross boundaries, I assume, in terms of learning, but actually change jobs midstream in the middle of an acquisition career, go from being an engineer to being a program manager. Is that sort of transition yeah, happening more frequently now? Um, it, it certainly should and can, uh, even within career fields. So in contracting, um, what we're doing is making it easier to move from one contracting discipline to another and give people the information they need and the training they'll need to do that. And, and there will be less required in each career field. So it will be easier to move from contracting to program management because there's less core that you need to learn and more opportunities to get the optional things. So that, that'll certainly be easier in the future. And Frank, going back to your anecdote about telling that class that it's going to be the last time that you ever see a, a room full of just program managers, has that transition already happened? And, and can you see benefits from it yet? So I, I, this engagement that Michelle that we're, you know, that, that Michelle is guilty of, to be perfectly honest, and she is quick to heap praise on the other folks that, uh, that help her uh, make that happen. One of the things that Jim Woolsey has told us to do is to expand our network. And, and I think when these, when these uh, forums that uh, Michelle uh, conducts, we don't, they just don't go out to the contracting community. I mean, they are, they are essentially broad announcement and things like, if you're interested in acquisition, you need to attend this. And I think that that's sort of changing, you know, changing an attitude that we've had in uh, two, and two attitudes that we need to attack. One is that I, as a program manager, should not be interested in contracting, that's the contracting officer's job. That's a fallacy. We can't we can't promote that any further. And the classes that we're developing now uh, attack that uh, right away. I'll tell you. The other one is the more dangerous one, one that I'm guilty of, and that is as a program manager, having gone through the class, a class a million years ago, by the way, where I was able to play the part of the contracting officer. I thought I was one. So when I would go back to my, my little program office back in Quantico, Virginia, I told my contracting officer everything that I knew. Thank God she would have none of it. She would have none of it. And she demanded that she goes, well, if you're going to be a contracting officer, read the FAR. If you want me to help you do your job, let's work together. And not only did I get that in Quantico, I got that when I worked at Navair together. Later on, when I had a chance to lead a large organization, we quickly realized that there were all these relationships between every one of our disciplines, whether or not that they were the old school 14 or the six that we have, or, or that the six that we're really focusing on now, um, it's each one, had, there's a relationship between an engineer and a contracting officer. It might be intellectual property. There's there's uh, a relationship between a contracting officer and our financial management, you know, officer. Can we afford, you know, the intellectual property that we that we think we want? So I th I think that we are seeing an awakening in terms of everybody's got to do their job. I'm not the expert, but it's only together that we are going to be able to uh, achieve our goals within the program offices and PEOs. And it may seem like an obvious question, but but let me just pull on that thread a little bit, Frank. I mean, wh why is it important if you're a program manager to be interested in contracting? What happens if you're not? I, I can give you Frank Kelly's uh, spin on this. So I already, I, you know, so we were joking bef before the segment that you know I'm a I'm a 
former Marine, and people will tell you there's no such thing as a former Marine. Um, your contract is your greatest leadership tool with respect to being a program manager. It's essentially the order that you issue folks outside the government. And, uh, and it, provide, it, it provides clarity in terms of what your intent is. Uh, peop, peop, it identifies roles and responsibilities. Now, I know that, 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 that I've exposed myself as not being a contracting officer, but that's the way I look at it. And so when it came time, you know, to making sure that I was being clear with industry and that I knew what I was going to get out at the end of the day, I didn't go back to my PowerPoint slides of briefings that I was going to give other folks within the government. I looked no further than the contract. What is the contract telling people to do? And I, and I needed my contracting officer to help me understand that. Let's see if we can get Michelle to brag a little bit more about the engagement piece. Um, <laughs> you, 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 we already talked about the, um, the, the special efforts that you've made to bring practitioners into these sessions. Um, but, but the other thing you've done is bring in industry, which I think is really important. Can you talk about what, what their contribution to this learning environment has been so far? Oh, my goodness. If we don't, we as the government, we as the acquisition strategist forming the strategy for the contract that Mr. Kelly just talked about, if we are not engaging with industry from the moment we have identified a need, then we waste a lot of time. I have seen some procurements, solicitations be put out on the street, they close, and there are no offers received. That is a tragedy. It's a waste of time and effort, and we're not supporting the warfighter. So when we get industry involved from the beginning, hey, what are you thinking? What's available? What's out there? Are we thinking about this correctly? So one of the tools that DAU created was the contract subway map. And it's a wonderful springboard to talk about where we are and where we need to go to get that contract that Mr. Kelly talked about. So we don't expect our program managers to be expert contracting folks, but we do expect that they understand the process and how to get there and how to craft the deal that will serve the warfighter. So they have to have a basic understanding of acquisition strategy, the competition landscape, you know, the small business goals that are part of the process, you know, the, the cyber clauses that are in our contracts, you know, the new Buy American, you know, that um, are currently in our contracts, but are going to change based on uh, uh, proposed rules with the executive order. So this learning at scale opportunities, we talk about a focused area. So we'll pick something on the subway map, maybe cyber. And we talk about it from the industry perspective. If we put a provision or a clause in a solicitation, then how does that affect you? What's your risk? How do you price it? How are we going to do compliance? When everybody hears that conversation, then we can figure out how to do it better. And when we're in our own lanes and we know what's important to each of us, we can, we can get what we want and still lose at the end of the day when we don't get an offer to our solicitation. We need industry to solve our problems. And we in the government have to understand how they leverage money, how they talk about risk, how they decide to be a partner with us. And the more we understand each other, the better and the faster we can go. Michelle and talked about conversation there, which I think is really important. The the PM um, brings to the conversation with the contracting officer uh, intimate knowledge of what the acquisition strategy is, a knowledge of what the industrial base concerns are, and so on. And for he or she to have a good conversation with the contracting officer, obviously they need to know what some of the options are, how the mechanisms work. The contracting officer, on the other hand, uh, would benefit from knowing the, about program management and strategy and the pressures that the program management is under. Conversation between government and industry, similar. If you can understand where the others coming from, the conversation will always be better. 
as as far as going back to very very early in the conversation where where, where Jim mentioned that we're we're moving from you know a requirements driven model moving from a schoolhouse driven model to to a learning platform as far as participation in these new sort of teaching offerings are are you seeing audience numbers that would suggest that people really are coming to them voluntarily <laughs> rather than because they they need to attend a class to meet a certification requirement we certainly are and that's obviously a characteristic of a platform is scale that you can reach a lot of people and reach them quickly. And um, the kinds of webinars that M Michelle is so good at putting on and attracting audiences for are really growing quickly. So that only last year that we we had uh, 17,000 attendees to 60 events, big numbers. Um, but um, this year we increased that by 30%. So that 28,000 people came to attend these webinars. We made it easy for them to get to. Um, we publicized those. And Michelle is really great at building a network and bringing people in. So 28,000, that's a significant number of people who are learning what they need to learn at the time they need to learn it with a minimum amount of uh, lost time for them, uh, minimal expense. We make it easy. That's another characteristic of a platform. And it really is growing. We're very encouraged about that. As far as the decision to to open these up to all comers, to industry, to people like me who want to watch them, was that was that a deliberate decision? Because it is it's really not the Department of Defense's default setting to to be as open and transparent with much of anything, frankly. But but what, did you guys decide to do that for any particular reason, or was it just the easiest way to go? If you want scale, you've got to invite a lot of people and more of that cross-pollinization. The more that you restrict the audience, the less input you're gonna get, the less conversation, less things are happening. Of course, that constrains a little bit the kinds of things we could talk about sometimes, but the, the, it's well worth it. The bigger audience is really a powerful thing. The diverse audience is a powerful thing. I want to take another short break here. We will come back in just a few minutes and continue our conversation with our guests from DAU. I'm Jared Serbu. You're listening to On DOD. Back in just a minute. Back on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Thanks for joining us for a special edition of On DOD, talking with three guests from Defense Acquisition University about some of the changes we're seeing in the defense acquisition, contracting, and pricing world. Jim Woolsey is the president of Defense Acquisition University. Frank Kelly is vice president of DAU. Also talking with Michelle Courier, professor of contract management at Defense Acquisition University. Um, want, want to talk a little bit about some of the the specific offerings that have that have come about, mostly under the 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 banner of something that that y'all are calling striking the balance, which I think was developed in partnership with OSD, really. Um, but but Jim, I think this gets back to where you started our whole conversation, which is this idea of empowering people to come get the training they need for their particular job purposes at any given time rather than plugging them into a preset um, series of curriculum in a schoolhouse, right? Well, that's right, Jared. We talked earlier about the empowering people to make decisions so that they can uh, make the best decisions with the knowledge they have at hand. And the theme of the series that Michelle put together, Striking the Balance, is important in that. If we're asking people to make decisions, we have to give them the tools and the knowledge to make those decisions in context, to really understand what the trade-offs are. And I think she's done a really great job putting a series together that helps people do that. I also want to say she's really shown that um, through her efforts and her way of going about this, you can get an audience on really detailed, kind of arcane sorts of knowledge that people need. It doesn't have to be um, exciting as most people would perceive it. There's a thirst for real knowledge that helps people get things done. And she's really tapped into that. And Michelle, just just to set this up for our audience, some of the specific to topics that that y'all have tackled under striking the balance are things like fixed price incentive fee contracts, balancing speed and price, performance based payments, price and data rights, cost plus incentive fees, and interestingly, I think understanding industry incentives. Uh, is there a through line through all of these things? Talk about how you develop the the individual topics here and and uh, how this all came together. So first of all, the idea came from the director of defense pricing, Ms. Janice Muskoff, and our DAU pricing expert, Dr. Renee Butler. And so they were struggling with 
how do we arrive at a fair and reasonable price and go fast? You know, the two aren't mutually exclusive. So that's where striking the balance where Ms. Muskoff and Dr. Butler came up with the idea of striking the balance. And so these topical areas under that brand, striking the balance, are more complex conversations with folks as they're trying to arrive at a fair and reasonable price. And so the, the audience that comes to those workshops are more advanced in their career as opposed to the entry level one through five uh, years of experience. These are folks that are working on uh, larger programs, more complex, um, and, and these different um, incentives, which are, which are complicated, um, bringing in industry so we understand what, what the share lines would be what would incentivize them to want to invest in our programs to be able to earn that incentive fee. So that's kind of, I think, where they, what they were thinking when they launched the Striking the Balance series. Yeah, let, let, let's pick up on that one, actually, because that was one of the, the interesting ones that, that I picked up on, too, is the understanding industry incentives piece. And I think for that, you actually brought in a member of industry and, and turned the whole session over to that person who explained in what some people would consider crass terms, what what actually feeds a CEO's bottom line. But that is actually what makes makes companies make decisions, right? In absolutely. a lot of cases. Yep, yeah, absolutely. We it would be not in the government's best interest to presuppose we understand what industry is thinking. And so being able to have someone from industry say, well, when you put a solicitation out there with, for example, a 50-50 share line, that doesn't jazz us. And here's why. And if we can get to that common understanding of what industry needs to be able to satisfy their shareholders to want to invest in one of our solicitations, we have to have that conversation. So the first piece that Ms. Muskoff thought we should start with is how does industry think? And, and if you were able to uh, jump in on that one, it was, it was uh, very nuts and bolts. It was no hold back. You know, we, we learned how industry thinks and what they think of us. So um, it, was, it was kind of eye-opening and um, a lot of good learning came out of those conversations. You plan on doing more of those things? I mean, it seems like an incredibly valuable thing for, for the defense acquisition workforce writ large to, to know. Yes, she plans on doing more of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, you heard it so here first. You've been eavesdropping because I just said to Mr. Kelly the other day, Mr. Kelly, we need to do an understanding industry series. And he says, okay, Courier, failure's not an option, which is what he always tells me when we want to launch something new. And I keep, I keep you know, saying to the folks at DAU, and they are successful. They are launching their own series, like Agile, you know, talking Agile series. The OTA Today series, where these are specific uh, communities that need content, uh, connection, and collaboration. So the groups that want to know OTAs all come together every month where experts from the field and industry come together and they talk for a couple hours. And the other benefit that is, is kind of a side benefit, but one that I like to brag about is the Department of Defense has an 80 hour of continuous learning points every two years so that our workforce stays current. What a fabulous way to stay current to jump on every month and connect with people that are doing the same mission as you and sharing best practices. So there's so many benefits of these kind of um, uh, collisions, bringing people together for these workshops um, that, you know, that are things that we didn't even imagine when we launched the pilot for the contracting officer representative series. Um, I'm glad you brought up OTAs, Michelle, because I, I did want to get into that a little bit, just because the the growth has been so explosive, and I know it's a topic that you've covered in a few of those striking the balance sessions. The, the numbers I pulled the other day, 
looks like back in 2016 when when things really got reinvigorated in the OTA space was about 1.6 billion dollars of obligations up to 9.7 billion just so far this year with a three month lag in FPDS. It it seemed like in those early days there was really just kind of one or two contracting offices throughout DOD who had become experts in, in leveraging OTs, but those kinds of numbers suggest that it's becoming much more widespread across a lot of different programs and a lot of different contracting offices. Is this the kind of tool that pretty much the entire workforce needs to at least understand and know how to leverage? I, absolutely. You know, knowledge is power. And so an OT, another transaction, is a tool in our toolbox, and there are appropriate uses for them when we are, are looking for new technology to uh, prototype, you know, for, you know, for, for different, for ways to solve different problems we have. It's not for everything. And so the OTA Today series has several product lines in that. We have monthly meetups where we talk about a specific topic and bring experts in. We have uh, mission assistance where we can go into a specific program and work with them through their curation of an OT uh, for that particular program. We do learning at scale events for Army, Navy, Air Force. The, the wonderful thing is that our subject matter experts in OTs are agile. We can put together any kind of an engagement that suits our customer needs. And I'm so proud of our Hallie Balkan, who is our subject matter expert, um, and her connections across the workforce. In fact, she's uh, part of the rewrite team for the new OTA guide. She is the lead on that with OSD. And so we're connected to the workforce. She's connected to the workforce by the mission assistance that she does with the individual offices, we get to know where the need and the training um, that the workforce needs, and we're able to funnel that into all of our products we give back to the workforce. I wanna go back to kind of the foundational point that Jim made toward the beginning of the segment, which is that this is all about empowering people instead of giving them a flow chart that says when you're supposed to use a fixed price versus a cost plus incentive fee contract the, uh, you, you know just as an idea that's not really new right you go back to better buying power 2.0 and frank kendall developed that he said the whole point of it was this is a guide to help you think not to tell you what to do so at least rhetorically this this kind of mindset has been out there for a while is there something different happening now, either just from an instructional standpoint or from how the, 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 the department writ large is thinking about acquisitions and trying to shape the workforce? It really um, comes down to um, culture as well as techniques that um, for so long we could afford to follow the rules, to be very um, structure process based. That worked really well in the competition with the Soviet Union. Um, for a lot of reasons, that was viable. The world is changing so fast now that we have to do it in a different way. And that does involve culture. Um, we had a case um, that I like to repeat in a DE class where we went through the whole drill and, and um, showed people, we brought an expert who had done something really creative to solve a problem. And we had each of the students come in first and say what they had done. Then they heard what the um, external expert had done. And one student said, if I tried that, I'd be killed. <laughs> um, so you really have to work on the culture. But the good news is that everything from law, the, the, uh, the uh, mid-tier acquisition, the software pathways that are in regulation, all the way down to what leadership says, everyone gets that. So the culture is changing it's where people can make their decisions and, and take their own risks. It's not a done deal. We got to keep working on it. But there's, uh, there's been a notable change that I think we've got to make, and I'm glad to see it. Need to take one more break here. We will be back in just a few minutes for a final segment with our guests. I'm Jared Serbu. This is On DOD, sponsored by ProPricer on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. 
Back on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. This is on DOD. I'm Jared Serbu. Special edition this week with three guests from Defense Acquisition University, Jim Woolsey, the president of DAU, Frank Kelly, vice president at DAU, and Michelle Courier, professor of contract management at DAU. And Michelle, I wanted to start with you on this on this uh, final segment here as we, as we start to wind down. You were mentioning to me off the air that one of the things that this new way of delivering content has done is start to develop communities of interest around people that were underserved. And the example that you had was the contractor, uh, contracting officer's representative community. Talk about how that kind of came together and coalesced into, a, I don't know if it's a formal community of practice, but, mm -hmm. but whatever it really is. Yeah, thank you for the question. We, um, we received an ask a professor question. We had the opportunity for government industry to write into us with a question, and then our subject matter experts will respond back. So the question came from a core that said, during quarantine, how do we uh, certify invoices? So rather than just respond back to that one core, we said, hey, let's pilot um, a community. And so they came. We had over 1,700 folks from 12 or 15 countries that are managing contracts um, for the Department of Defense. So what we did was we reached out to folks in the field that are working in those systems that support the contracting officer representative um, to answer their questions real time. They would share their screen, they would go into the systems and they would show folks how to actually do it. And so from there, we had folks at DAU, David Dotson and Cindy Baker who said, hey, let's keep the conversation going and they formed a weekly meetup for the cores. So any time during that uh, uh, once a week meetup, they can come in, ask a question, and immediately receive some advice and counsel on how to proceed. So that's how the course started. And then we launched nine other communities, specifically agile and digital engineering, uh, contract law, the contract law series that we partnered with GW Law was what we did this summer uh, as uh, in support of the executive order for um, more ethical uh, acquisitions um, in the Department of Defense. So um, Mr. Kelly is really great at answering this question, you know, about the power of the platform. And he uh, always says yes. And so Mr. Kelly, you know, share, share the power of our platform. Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, uh, and uh, so I guess I was supposed to thank Jared, but maybe I'll thank Michelle, you know, for teeing that up one for me. So, you know what, so I'm the vice president, right? You know, so there's there's somebody in DAU that no matter what, when they tell me to jump, you know, all I do is I ask how high, and you probably think that's Jim Woolsey, and it's not, it's Michelle Courier. Uh, uh, I probably no longer have a job now. So one of the things that struck me about the whole core event, by the way, was as a platform. So Woolsey has us thinking about DAU as a platform. And then Michelle started to kick this thing off with the course. Now, if you're a program manager like I was, you can either learn the easy way or the hard way how a core can impact your program. And I'm telling you, you need to, those people want to be there to help you. And so you need to help them. And so this work that Michelle did to reach out to them was critically important. But there was a tactical piece that Michelle had to solve. And, you know, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say she probably wasn't the expert, but she went out to the army and found an expert to help conduct literally a workshop for thousands of people. And, you know, that would to me was perfectly in line with what Jim Woolsey wanted us to be as a platform, you know, to get the learning and the instruction out there. Now, I got to tell you, I, I was on that particular episode of Core Cafe. Uh, I was completely lost. I was bored to tears with the application that people were running through, but they were interested and it really mattered to them. And I mean, for some of them, this was life-saving instruction that they were getting. And Michelle found somebody who was the expert, you know, to get that done. So that's people that need knowledge. We also found at DAU that there are people that want to get knowledge out there. And Jim Woolsey allowed us to do a TEDx event. We've done our three years of TEDx DAU, which allows people to get the word out there. And I'll tell you, some of, our, some of our most popular speakers are the folks in this contracting and pricing community that get to go out there 
um, and, and speak, and they do a fantastic job. So the idea of being a platform is very powerful for DAU. In our last few minutes, I, I, I guess the way I want to start to wind down here is, you, you know, expanding your network, creating this new platform, bringing new people in. That, that's all great. But, but somebody watching this could get the sense that DAU only does webinars now, which I know is not true. There is still a lot of formal classroom instruction, even if a lot of that is virtual. How do you blend those two things? How do they fit together in this modern world? It really, um, that's a really good point. And I, I'm glad you gave us the opportunity to correct that impression before it got too big. Because uh, um, certainly uh, classroom or now virtual training is part of it. Um, a website that has tools that people need is part of it. Going out and helping teams succeed at the thing they're doing that day, a, a kind of consulting we do is part of it. The, the question is to have, or the, the, the goal is to have as many tools as you can have and use the right one for the right thing. And um, in the past, our toolbox was a lot smaller and it's gotten a lot bigger. We have a lot more tools to use and I think we can meet needs better that way. Yeah, and does one feed into the other? Because it seems like some of this has been a discovery process. Without that Ask the Professor session that Michelle brought up, you probably wouldn't have known that there was a big hunger out there among, for example, cores. So I, I could see that potentially leading to maybe formal instruction in, in ways that you, that you didn't know you needed to offer before literally every day that what we learn doing the consulting comes into the classroom we get powerful examples from others that we bring into the classroom uh, that feeds to a webinar sometimes we use pieces of webinars in a class um, we are getting really uh, making a lot of progress on breaking down those boundaries and that's a powerful tool as well All right. I think that is probably a good place for us to wrap up. I really appreciate all of our guests taking the time with us to talk about not only how DAU is instructing the acquisition workforce, but how things are moving into the future in the defense acquisition pricing and contracting world. Our guests have been Jim Woolsey, president of Defense Acquisition University, Frank Kelly, vice president at DAU, and Michelle Currier, professor of contract management at DAU. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. You're listening to On DoD on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network, sponsored by ProPricer. I'm Jared Serbu.